In the movies, at least the ones I watch, things are always blowing up. People... Cars... and houses. But I want to know, how is a real explosion different to a movie explosion? If there was a real explosion, could I still walk away in slow motion like an action movie hero? I've always been fascinated with how the world works, and I've got lots of questions about why things happen. To find out the answers, I'm going to blow stuff up. An explosion is a sudden and violent change of state that produces a shockwave which can sometimes destroy things if they're too close. I'm going to produce an explosion using this large container of liquid nitrogen. And the detonator in this hopefully safe experiment is this bucket of boiling water. And when I add that to the liquid nitrogen, you'll see that sudden violent state change that I was talking about. The boiling water instantly turns the freezing liquid nitrogen into a gas. But I wasn't blown to pieces because, in this case, the change from a liquid to a vapour was relatively slow. So, instead of a deadly shockwave, we got this lovely, gentle, rolling fog. But one way to increase the energy of explosion is to constrain the reaction inside a much smaller space. I'm going to use liquid nitrogen again, a lot less this time, but the reaction is going to be even more dramatic. And that's because I'm constraining the liquid nitrogen into this small plastic bottle. And... Uh, then we're going to put that inside this red plastic bin with a thousand ping pong balls, which means we're shaping and focusing all of that energy, which means a much more violent explosion. Right, Des, I'm the bomb. The nitrogen has turned from a liquid into a gas. It expanded to a size about 600 times bigger than its liquid state. That change in the fact that it was contained caused this explosion. What determines the power of an explosion? Well, basically, it's the rate of oxidation or combustion, and that can happen in lots of different ways and at lots of different speeds. In this incredibly exciting explosion, rust, the rate of combustion is very slow. It's just a few millimetres per century, and really the only way to see that is with time-lapse photography. Oxidation is a chemical reaction that releases energy, and rust is no exception, it's just really, really slow. The next level of oxidation is fire, and that combusts at a few centimetres per hour. But we want to go to the next level of oxidation, where things get faster and more dangerous. So it's worth pointing out at this point that over there, we've got my explosives expert, Martin Van Teel, who has a PhD in chemistry, and we've got a medic with truckloads of medical stuff. They are overseeing everything that we do, so don't try this at home. Ever. When this liquid fuel hits the fire, it's going to oxidise considerably faster. Slowed down, you can see that the fuel isn't exploding. The vapour's oxidising much more quickly than a wood fire, but it's still at a slow enough rate to be considered a fire. It's still not technically an explosion. For that, we we'll need an oxidation rate of metres or even kilometres per second. And for that, I'm going to need black powder, an explosive made from sulphur, charcoal, 
and with potassium nitrate as an oxidizer. Martin Van Thiel has a license to make fireworks, and he shows me how to grind and mix the three components into a fine powder. It's kind of like a cooking show, but fun, because <laughs> you're going to blow stuff up with it. All we need now is a bit of heat to set off the chemical reaction. It even smells like Guy Fawkes too. The black powder fizzles tamely. To make it explode, we need to contain it just like we did with the liquid nitrogen and the ping pong balls, and the speed of burning is then gonna increase significantly. Black powder probably originated in China a thousand years ago. So I wanna make an old school Chinese bamboo cracker. It will turn into needle-like shrapnel. So the plan is simple, light it, and walk like hell. Oh, there we go. Yes, he's exploded. Nice. When I set fire to the black powder, it starts off a chemical reaction, which is basically the potassium nitrate stealing electrons from the charcoal and the sulfur. And this rapid burning happens at an explosive speed, traveling at hundreds of meters per second. Black powder, otherwise known as gun powder, is something that has changed the history of the world, possibly more than any other invention. So you've got a cannon. Of course I've got a cannon. <laughs> so what's the basic principle here, Martin? Well, this is a muzzle-loading cannon. It's so a Napoleon replica. So we basically load everything from the muzzle end. We put the powder in, put the cannonball in, and then we light the fuse. Black powder is a low explosive, so you don't say it detonates, you say it deflagrates. A clever-sounding way of saying it burns quickly. But when you get a breech or a cannon barrel to confine that combustion, you get a real explosion. And when people figure that out, they put the bow and arrow makers out of business in a second. Beautiful, that's all the way home. So now we're loaded. We're loaded. So is it literally just light the fuse? Light the fuse, well we'll aim it first. We'll make sure we hit the bucket. Aiming is as basic as you get. Happy with that? Okay, light the fuse. The slow motion shot shows that aiming is a lot harder than we thought. We skipped over the top. We missed. I thought we'd lined it up pretty well. <laughs> Good God. If we slow it down some more, you can see the cannonball zooming past a few centimetres above the bucket. We can't even aim it then. We have to put it right next to it. Let's go forward, because I want to kill this bucket now. It's become quite personal. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> gotcha, bucket. <laughs> That's what I call artillery. <laughs> Next, it's time to try something even more explosive. This is actual TNT. That's actual TNT. And it's my turn to audition to be an action movie hero. I'm trying to find out the difference between a movie explosion and a real world explosion. Black powder explosions aren't that spectacular by themselves. You need to soup them up, and that's where fireworks come in. Martin Van Thiel is a pyrotechnic expert and we're building a firework, adding different chemicals to the black powder. So we need to load one side with some stars. Martin's showing me how to build a brocade crown. Then we'll add the burst charge. A spectacular firework with a 150 metre burst radius. And this particular one will feature in the finale of a big show he's orchestrating. That's what it looks like. Over here, Nigel, we've got a mortar especially for the finale. <laughs> Basically, there's the lift charge at the bottom of this shell, yep. which will send this out of this mortar at about 300 kilometres an hour. And then we'll just attach the igniter to this. And we'll just cover that up. Make sure that no stray sparks land in that mortar. Ready? 
Do you get anxious at this point? Yeah. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, go. The extra chemicals we added earlier to the gunpowder change the colours of the explosions. This red comes from strontium, and magnesium makes this blinding white look. Oh, that was my one! And those dazzling silver sparkles are created by the titanium. So, now we can add a firework element to the movie explosion that we are going to make. So fireworks are part of the low explosive family, and that's basically anything with black powder in it. If you want your explosion to be even more powerful, you have to find a way to mix the oxygen and the fuel together at the molecular level. And the first one to do that was Alfred Nobel in the 1860s when he invented the first high explosive, dynamite. This is black powder, our low explosive. It doesn't have enough power to punch a hole in the tin. All we've really done is made a loud noise and left a black smudge. Next is a few grams of Semtex, a high explosive. The fuel and oxidizer are mixed all in one molecule. So firing in three, two, one. Wow. <laughs> so, Martin, clearly high explosives are quite different. Well, obviously we've generated a super high pressure zone right in the middle here. Part of that metal's just gone straight into the bank. That pressure has just expanded and basically peeled this metal backwards. And how fast is this explosion going? Eight kilometres a second. This shows the true destructive power of high explosives. We've created a blast wave that has energy speeding out at eight kilometers per second. If there had been more Semtex, the air would have turned into a supersonic blast wave, killing us all. Now it's time to find out what happens when explosions happen in the real world with real explosives. Can I walk away in slow motion like an action movie hero? We're going to blow up this small shed twice. The first time is going to be movie style, so it's going to look spectacular, but it should be able to stand quite close. And then the second time is with high explosives, and we'll see what happens if I stand too close to that. OK, so we'll be working with um, a variety of explosives, everything from propellants all the way up to high explosives. Movie explosions are a mixture of low explosives with a bit of firework flair. They look amazing, but they can be dangerous. Um, so what goes in here, Martin? We've got a hydrocarbon fuel. Yep. So we're basically burning enough fuel that you can go from Auckland to Hamilton. <laughs> and <laughs> each of them <laughs> in about two seconds. Right. Nice. Real demolition involves high-speed explosives, like the bit of Semtex we use to punch a hole in the sheet metal to change the volatility a little bit. And black powder is used to lift and ignite the fuel. Then fireworks are added. So these little charges here will produce a 30 metre ball of sparks. So the explosive charge will go directly on, on that plate, so it'll keep all nice and clear around it. So we're almost ready to go. Let me give you a quick tour of my Wendy house in the quarry. Out the front, a low explosive and two fuel bombs. On the side here, these two rather small looking little white plastic containers, which will give me 30 metre diameter showers of sparks. And out in the backyard, two fuel mortars, which will produce an enormous fireball. So all we need to do now is push the button and hopefully walk away unharmed. I've had a last minute idea. I want to put a cardboard me right between our two mortars in the back garden to see if I'll survive. Right, we're all set. The only thing left now is the slow motion action movie, Walk Away.
I'm finding out the difference between a movie explosion and a real world explosion. The Wendy house is now rigged to blow up just like in the movies. Right, we're all set. The only thing left now is the slow motion action movie, Walk Away. You can clearly see the fireworks attached to the side railings sparkle in this replay. The chemical element zirconium creates that effect. You can feel the heat. Oh, exactly. But yep. no, no shockwave, just no, the heat. No, you just just a loud noise. So just a few little fragments here and there. So this is what is that? Just that plastic? Yeah, a little bit of a little bit of plastic from the bag type thing. A little bit of fuel on the ground. The house survives with just the smallest amount of structural damage. And so when we go to old Nigel around the back, it looks like so the splatter. What's the splatter? Well, that's just a little bit of residue from the fuel. Right. So as the fireball develops, a few little droplets will fall outside of the fireball. Grab the end of that, Nigel. So this is this is basically the high explosive. Yes, this is the high explosive charge. So we're going to do a 2.5 kilo charge in this hut. What does it look like? Well, let's open the box and find out. So here's our charge here. That's it. That's it. There's two and a half kilos in there. And it, it, it's kind of quite safe at this point, isn't it? Because <coughs> You can bang it. See, I should have asked you, can you bang it before I actually yes. started banging it? Yes, it's a very insensitive explosive. It's still an explosive. Right. So how do we initiate this? We've got a booster. So we've actually got TNT in this booster, oh, wow. mixed with some other explosives. So this is, this is actual TNT? That's actual TNT. Can I bang this? That's a different... Yes, it's safe, but it's still a high explosive. So... No. <laughs> I'll give you that one back. Because the high explosive is so stable, it needs a large blast to set it off. So that's what the less stable TNT is used for. And that TNT is set off itself by a primary explosive, otherwise known as a detonator. So not that cardboard me survived quite well, but I thought for the, for the high explosive, I wanted something a bit more kind of substantial. So I've gone for the mannequin me. High explosives are very dangerous, so the team is putting up cardboard nigels to see what kind of damage the blast will do and how far it will travel. So I've redecorated my little villa in the quarry for our real world explosion. The first thing that you'll notice is there's nothing outside, no paraphernalia at all. Instead, I've gone for a bit of a minimalist look. Just two and a half kilos of high explosives all wired to blow. So at this point, I'm gonna close the door and run. 10, nine, eight. Seven, it's time for the real world eight, explosion. This time five, you'll notice I'm a little bit four, further away. So three, now the slow motion two, action movie, one. Walk Away. Being so far away made the shot ho-hum compared to the movie explosion, but it was 1,000 times more dangerous. The house is kindling. On the right side of the frame, you can see cardboard Nigel 10 metres from the explosives being taken down. The high explosive gets air molecules travelling at supersonic speeds. It would cause lethal damage if you were close enough. And in this angle, you can see Manic and Nigel hurled 20 or 30 metres. This is the most dangerous part of an explosion. Then, of course, there's the shrapnel to look out for. This camera is taken out completely, but you can see it go flying through the air in this shot. There it is, that crate flying on the right. I felt that. You should have. Like, that was qualitatively <laughs> different, wasn't it? Oh, exactly. So you've got a very 
very short duration, intense pulse there. And when that big boom went off, as I was walking away, I was expecting little bits of shed to hit me in the back the whole time, <laughs> which I didn't feel the first time around. No. But that time was like you just, you felt it. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, we found the door. <laughs> so. That's the door. A little bit of door. Cardboard Nigel, standing where I did my movie explosion walk away, has debris flying past him. So this is me at the point that I was standing just before. Exactly. And That's exactly what we are trying to avoid. Imagine being struck by that. So You're lucky. You're extremely lucky. It was right there. This is about 10 metres. Yep. I think you got a, your, your neck severed there. <laughs> but I think your neck was uh, the one that's... Yeah, that's... Yeah. He's gone. And our... Speaking of gone, our house is gone. It's gone. <laughs> it's just bits. Also missing in action is Mannequin Nigel. This camera angle shows that he's been thrown 30 metres by the blast wave into the side of the quarry. This is... Huge. So basically, it looks like something struck my face. Yes, it's gone straight through the back. And has right gone out and taken off the back of my head, basically. Yep. And then the rest of it is... Oh, yeah. God, look at that. <laughs> so we've actually got a bit of shrapnel stuck into my liver, or something down there. And um, got we've just got lots wings, of little yeah. holes all yep. over the place. And the back is just completely and utterly destroyed. So all that movie stuff, that's movie stuff. Real world stuff results in holes in your head and bits of wood in your liver. Who's gonna clean it up? <laughs> Based on this evidence, you can casually walk away from a real explosion like an action movie hero. You just have to be a long, long way away. The backyard of this Auckland house hides an unusual device, a machine that makes lightning. It was invented by Nikolai Tesla in 1891, and this Tesla coil is the biggest in the world. It's seven metres tall, and that's two million volts of deadly electricity pulsating in the night sky. But compared to lightning from the clouds, that is just a fluffy kitten. If you've ever wondered what is lightning, and what would it be like to be struck by lightning, would you survive? I'm going to find out. In this episode, I'll be testing conductivity by putting electricity through a small child. We see what kind of destruction a whole lot of ants can do and what small electric shocks do to a human, as well as what big electric shocks do. And at the high voltage lab, I'll try to survive a lightning bolt. And three, two, one. I've always been fascinated with how the world works, and I've got lots of questions about why things happen. To find out the answers, I'm going to blow stuff up. Every time you get a zap, when you take the clothes out of the clothes dryer or you touch a door handle, that's lightning. Kind of. That zap is produced by static electricity. The Greek philosopher Thales was the first to describe static electricity. Now, he didn't have a clothes dryer, but he did have a cat. And for reasons that aren't entirely clear, he liked to rub his cat with amber. When he did that, he noticed two things immediately. One, it was very relaxing. And two, the amber seemed to develop a strange force which meant that it could pick up feathers. Thales thought that that meant the amber had a soul, but then he was a bit of a cat rubber, so you can't really expect much there. A few thousand years later, and we've got electricity mostly figured out. 
We all know that everything is made of atoms, which are like small solar systems with a central mass holding everything together and electrons orbiting around the outside. But the cool thing is that some of those electrons are able to move, and it's that movement of electrons which is electricity. One place where this happens again and again is when tall buildings are struck by lightning. Auckland's Sky Tower has been hit thousands of times. To see how it protects itself, I'm going to have to climb up the building on a ladder. Holy <laughs> oh, 300 metres above the ground. Oh my God. Sitting at the top of this tower is a device designed by the American inventor Benjamin Franklin. This is the very top of the Sky Tower and it's the highest building in the Southern Hemisphere. And because lightning always tends to strike the tallest thing around, they needed this thing, which is a lightning conductor. And that channels all of the energy from the lightning bolt safely to the ground, which is why the Sky Tower is still standing after thousands of lightning strikes. So why does the Sky Tower's conductor attract lightning? A 300-year-old experiment answers this question. In 1730, Stephen Gray set up an intriguing experiment that he called the Hanging Boy. He suspended an orphan from silken ropes and put a small electric charge on the boy's body. I'm going to try and recreate the experiment with static electricity and gold foil, but we couldn't get our hands on an actual orphan, so we're using Freya here. You all right, Freya? Yeah. When the static electricity generator is switched on, electricity begins to flow through the child. And then something magical begins to happen. Our child builds up a positive charge, and one side of the gold leaf becomes negatively charged, and opposites attract. The experiment showed that electricity could pass through some things, little kids, and not other things, like silk. And that led him to divide the world into two categories. Conductors, things like kids and copper, and insulators, things like silk and glass. So if we're thinking about lightning, how does the air change from an insulator into such an incredibly dramatic conductor? The high voltage lab at the University of Canterbury is the perfect place to find out. This device can simulate lightning. Perfect for me to find out what it's like to be hit by lightning. Paul Agger is in charge of this million volt machine. What I'll get you to do, Nigel, is to activate this button here on the count of three, um, and that will initiate our lightning impulse across the spheres. OK, so I'm just bringing up the voltage now. So how much in there now? There's a million volts ready to go. OK, and on three, two, one. The thunder created by our lightning bolt is deafening, but the bolt itself is too fast to see. I still want to find out how the lightning turns air into a conductor. So we've brought in this little puppy, the Phantom V642, which shoots in super slow motion, so that you can see things like this, and this, and this, and hopefully lightning travelling through the air. Three, two, one. But we've got a major problem with the new camera. And the problem is science's fault. Dead. Basically, every time we fire the lightning bolt, what it does is it changes all the electrical charges in the room, um, and the camera's super sensitive, so it just dies every time. So now we've got two scientists working away on a plan B and a plan C. We just stand here until they tell us to do something. This will be interesting to see if it works. Their solution is to wrap the camera up in a Faraday suit, a mesh cloth that can block electric fields. But will the science work? OK. Three, two, one. <laughs> and now we can observe the lightning at 500 times slower than normal. And even then, it's all over in a second. Oh, wow. 
what was happening there then is the electrons and the air molecules separating and then re-establishing, creating the plasma rack between the two. The lightning wants to get from the top sphere to the bottom sphere. As the negative charge in the cloud travels, it heats the air, creating a channel for the lightning to travel through. At two and a half thousand times slower, we can see the channel form, but there's not a camera in the world that can capture the lightning traveling through the channel. But when lightning travels further, we can see this cooking of the air. It happens quite slowly, relatively speaking, taking hundreds of milliseconds. And when the channel's formed, the lightning's discharged in a few blinding microseconds. So if the awesome power of a lightning bolt can heat air to 50,000 degrees, what would it do if it hit me? Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be struck by lightning? Well, I have, so I've decided to find out, beginning with this thing, a Leiden jar. It was invented about 200 years ago, and it's kind of like lightning in a bottle, but the bloke who invented it wasn't sure that it was a good idea. In fact, he wrote to a friend of his, and he said, and I quote, I wish to advise you of a new but terrible experiment I urge you on no account to personally attempt. I received a shock to my right hand of such violence that my whole body was shaken as if by lightning. In short, I thought that I was done for. Now clearly, with a build-up like that, I have to touch it, don't I? Oh my god! <laughs> That's quite unpleasant. <laughs> that was just a small dose of lightning. But why exactly was it so painful? Understanding why electricity is dangerous really means understanding Ohm's law, which is a fairly complicated relationship between resistance, amps, and volts. But here's the guts of it for normal people. Amps are the really dangerous part, because amps are the part that will burn you and stop your heart. But volts push the amps along. So this looks quite spectacular because it's really high voltage, but it's very low amps. So when I put it into my potato, nothing really happens. But I'm wondering, if I put lots and lots of amps into that potato, what might happen then? Because we're dramatically increasing the amps, things are now very dangerous. And remember the Faraday suit we wrapped our camera in? Well, we're using a bigger version of Faraday cage to hopefully keep our cameraman alive. So the voltage is the same as before, but we've increased the amps from virtually nothing to 3,000. Mind you, it's only a tenth of the amps found in your average lightning bolt. Have you ever zapped a potato before? No. We've never stopped a potato. It's, it's uncharted territory for this lab. Three, two, one. I can't understand why we've never blown a potato before. <laughs> we should have done this already. With the increased amps, the potato stood no chance. Sausage this time, more like people. Three, two, one. It's a banger. <laughs> One thing that actually seems to work really well is the thing that's most like an actual person. <laughs> <laughs> it's all very well to make a sausage explode in a blast chamber at a high voltage laboratory, but what impact does electricity have on an actual human being? The sausage was blasted with 3,000 amps, but we're giving our subject just 5 milliamps supplied by three AAA batteries. It's well below the 100 milliamps considered lethal to a human. Renowned chef Michael van der Elzen is used to operating under pressure, but what effect will electric shocks have on his performance? So I'm going to make a broccoli tart. So first up, I'm going to take an egg. So I want to separate the white from the yolk. So just run the, run the white into a bowl. Oh, jeepers, creepers! Ah, ah. <laughs> I'll just take the showers out and we continue on. The brain sends messages round the body wow. using electric current. So when external electricity enters the body, it disrupts those signals, short-circuiting them, and the usual result is muscles contracting in an uncontrollable manner. <laughs> Can we swap places? <laughs> the, the electric shock just takes over. 
it just makes you spasm and, and just add all the ingredients into a bowl. So now we just take our walnut dressing. <laughs> wow, it's pretty hard to make somebody look, <laughs> look tidy, I tell you. Look at that. I couldn't, I couldn't have placed it even better if I tried. <laughs> So what we've been able to conclusively demonstrate is that even the small electric shock that you get from three AAA batteries makes it incredibly difficult for your body to function. But what if it was even bigger? A lightning bolt is 60 million times stronger than that AAA shock. If I want to survive being struck by lightning, I'm going to need some help. And maybe the answer lies in the material that allowed our slow motion camera to keep working or the cage that protected our cameraman. It's called the Faraday cage or Faraday suit and it works by channeling electricity. The voltage is constant across the exterior but no current is allowed into the interior. And you're saying this thing, which stopped our camera from shutting down with the lightning bolt, if I'm wearing this, I'm not gonna die when we do the lightning arc. That's correct. So you wouldn't be uh, offended if we just did a couple more things to test out this Faraday principle thing first before I climb up into the lightning arc? No problem at all, Nigel. Good. I wouldn't say that I was scared to be hit by lightning wearing only that suit, but what about if we tried out the principle in something a bit more like the cage? So here's my idea which is either complete genius or utterly stupid. But if the lightning strikes my car, then it should act just like my Faraday suit and channel all of that current around the outside and leave me safe on the inside. This experiment is incredibly dangerous, and with my life at risk, my posse of scientists are being extra thorough to ensure I survive. So it turns out that none of the camera operators actually want to sit in the car with me, so I'm having to do some of that myself by setting one up in the corner. But I'm sure it will all go very well. So basically, it seems pretty much set up. Um, I reckon let's start with 100,000 volts, and if I'm still alive, let's go for the full million after that. I'll see you on the other side. Go on, you Nigel. Thank you, Paul. Now you might be thinking that it's the car tyres that'll save me, but it's not. A lightning bolt is so powerful, it'll jump round the tyres straight into the earth. What will hopefully keep me alive is the theory of the Faraday cage. The lethal lightning bolt will run round the edges of the car into the ground, and I'll emerge happy and alive. The thing that makes me wonder a little bit is when they say they've never done this before, so this is the first time they've done this, a little bit anxiety provoking. Okay. Nigel. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. The first 100,000 volt arc is a test, but a potentially lethal test, nevertheless. Quite an eerie experience to sit in a car and feel that <laughs> you can hear that sort of bzz, high voltage stuff knowing that it's right there. But it ended happily, so I think thus far Faraday is completely right. But the car did suffer some serious paint meltdown. I'm somewhat concerned that when we increase the power by a thousand percent, that it'll be more than the paint that gets damaged. I can't stop thinking about what the lightning did to that poor sausage. Is that gonna happen to me? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. one million volts, centimetres from my head. This is the most dangerous thing I've ever done in a car. And now it's time to do it again without the car. I survived being hit by lightning when I used my car as a Faraday cage, but what effect will lightning have on me without any protection at all? Three, two, one. 
And when I say me, I mean this me. We're going to hit dummy Nigel with a 100,000 volt continuous lightning arc. Okay. He's dressed to impress in a spiffy nylon tracksuit. Now obviously the human body has its own conductive properties, um, which might be slightly different to a mannequin. But we've cunningly rigged up a number of contraptions, wires and sticky tape, to make it kind of, at the very least, me shaped It's time to draw a line in the sand. I think science is trying to tell me something. I think it's saying that deliberately setting out to get struck by lightning is a really, really dumb idea. So having just witnessed this, it has somewhat shaken my confidence about the whole experiment and the Faraday suit thing, because um, I'm not sure that something that looks like painter's overalls is going to save me from this. My face is on fire. So now we're going to do exactly the same thing, except this time it will be me. And I'm putting my faith in a theory that's about 200 years old. Good God. I can no longer put off the inevitable. It's time to repeat the experiment, but this time, instead of a mannequin in a track suit, it's me in a Faraday suit. The whole suit is threaded through with a metallic weave, which supposedly will keep me alive. OK, now you can. OK, is that comfortable? Do you need to adjust that? That's good. Put the hood up. So, I don't look quite as Iron Man as I was hoping. And the other thing is that usually in these situations, I say to myself, well, what's the worst that could happen? But actually, now this little voice comes back and it says, well, your suit could fuse. You could have a cardiac arrest and burst into flames. <laughs> so, shall we go and see what happens? Let's go and have a look. This time for one last safety check. OK, team, we're going to do the hazard identification assessment prior to going ahead. Um, so, obviously, we've got high voltage supplies present within this demonstration, and that would be Nigel. He is our high voltage supply. He's going to be at 70,000 volt potential, so he is the risk. We need to maintain a safe distance from him, and that's, you know, via the demarcation which we've set on the floor here. Um, with the microphone, obviously, a nice big conductive rod. We don't want that anywhere near Nigel. OK, that's it. Thanks, team. 16,000 volts. 20,000. So there comes a time when you have your theory, but you must put it to the test. So if Faraday was right, this should look great. If he was wrong, then I will die. 60,000, 70,000, 80,000, 90,000, it's 100,000 volts. So I'm now tingling, and I'm about to see if Faraday really was a genius or he was completely wrong. This is about 1% of the strength of a lightning bolt, but it's still enough to give me lethal burns and to stop my heart beating. Turns out that, uh... Turns out, oh, that's my glowing red finger. Turns out that Faraday was actually a genius. There's 100,000 volts surrounding me, flowing over the suit. It plays havoc with the electronics of the microphone. Still, if that's the worst thing that happens to me, I'm not going to complain. The basic principle here is that all that electricity flows, flows around the outside through my Faraday suit, leaving this vacuum of quite pleasant relaxedness inside. So, without it, I'd be dead. But when I'm inside it, I can literally juggle lightning. It's quite cool. 
So, I didn't get hit by actual lightning. That would be actual stupid. But I'd settled for the tingle of 100,000 volts in a Faraday suit over being hit by real lightning any day.